So, the Game Boy Advance was my favorite childhood time waster. There are essentially four versions. The original from 2001, which launched just before the GameCube. There was the GBA SP in 2003, which was foldable and had a lit screen. In 05, an updated version called the AGS 101 released with a better backlit screen. And then that same year, the Game Boy Micro released. But going back to play on these consoles, though, there's something that I noticed that my dumb little kid brain didn't really care about. Um, these screens all suck. And it's not really about the resolution either. The first models of GBA and GBASP had just such washed out colors. And with the original system, you actually needed to sit by another light source so you could even see what you were doing, which is, you know, fun. The revised SP model had much better colors, if not slightly oversaturated, but this created another problem. It's so blurry. Uh, these new screens had terrible ghosting, which made moving objects smeared out. The problem exists also in the DS Lite, but not to the same extent. Heck, the only good screen on an official Game Boy Advance is... Game Boy Micro! Ugh. I mean, the Game Boy Micro is a really cool piece of hardware, but do you really want to play on this for hours on end? I mean, it's just too small, and the lack of support for original Game Boy and Game Boy Color games just really kills it. But what's this? In 2003, just before the Game Boy Advance SP launch, Nintendo released an accessory for the GameCube called the Game Boy Player. Evidently, Nintendo felt bad after giving us mysterious ports on the bottom of their consoles that were never used, at least in America. It was a full, fat Game Boy Advance in a box that uses a GameCube controller for input and can be played on TV. It also had this nifty little eject button that's just fun to play with. There was just one problem. It also kinda sucked. Don't get me wrong, playing games on the TV is great, but the software used to launch and display the games was just not good. The scaling was blurry and there was noticeable input lag, and there was this annoying jitter. Now some of it was understandable, as the Game Boy had this oddball frame rate of 59.73Hz instead of the much more sensible US standard of 59.94Hz. Because of this discrepancy, um, an extra frame needed to be added about every 4 seconds or so, but the way that the Game Boy player does it is just bad. This is where the homebrew community stepped in. Meet the Game Boy interface, a bit of software meant to run in place of the Game Boy player disc, allowing for better functionality and just more features. And since the Game Boy player disc is often significantly more expensive than the base unit itself, this can save you some money. The version I'm most interested in, though, is the SR edition, which stands for Speedrun. This version is optimized to be played on CRTs and runs at a proper 240p with minimal input lag. There still exists a duplicate frame about every 4 seconds, but this does it just much more plainly. Um, and there's actually a way to make it run at the GBA's original frame rate, if you have something like a Sony PVM or an OSSC. All you really need to get this working is a GameCube, duh, a Game Boy Player, Duh. and any way to run homebrew, which in my case was with just a regular GameCube memory card, a soft modded Wii with GameCube ports, um, and a copy of The Wind Waker. This isn't the only way, nor the cheapest way to run homebrew, but it's what I had available. My biggest concern was input lag. Uh, while a few extra frames is fine for playing Pokemon, it's really important for action-packed hardcore games like Shrek 2. So I set up my iPhone to record at 240 frames per second, and then I counted how many frames there were in between the button presses and then the reaction on the screen. For each test, I counted the lag 16 times and then I took the average. First, to get a baseline, I tested an original Game Boy Advance and then also an original Fat DS so that I'd had multiple data points. And uh, yeah, this is kind of odd. Uh, the DS actually took about a frame longer than the original system. I retested this a bunch of times, and both on the top and the bottom screens, and it stayed the same. I wasn't expecting this at all, um, and I couldn't find anything online mentioning this. I might revisit this in the future uh, and test the lag of different GBA and DS revisions. Now for the Game Boy Player. First I tried it with the original disc, and oof. Yeah, this is a whopping three frames later than the original. This is what I'd call noticeable for most people. Next, I tried the normal Game Boy interface software, which allows for scaling and other functions. Lag is lower than the disc, but it's still 2.5 frames higher than the Game Boy Advance. Next was the speedrun version, and now we're talking. Lag was basically identical to the DS. Now about that speedrun version, I mentioned that it outputs in 240p, and if you have an old Trinitron laying around, then dang it looks good. The scan lines fit the 2D sprites perfectly. 
The black borders can be a bit annoying, but it's worth it for the extra clarity. Here's a side-by-side -side video capture using the speedrun version versus using the Game Boy Player disc. And this is using the same capture device over the same S-video cable. What, do you think I'm made out of money? Here's another comparison using some scan lines to kind of represent how it looked on the TV. And personally, I think it looks really good. But we need to talk about the small mushy elephant in the room. As much as I love the GameCube controller, its D-pad is hot garbage. This clearly was not designed to be used. There was an official controller made by Hori for the Game Boy Player, but uh, what, do you think I'm made out of money? That's where this comes in. You can pick one of these up from Rafnet, and it'll let you use a good old SNES controller on a GameCube. Definitely an improvement. Even if the D-pad on these old controllers can be a bit hit or miss, depending on how badly it was abused. And that's where this comes in. These are new SNES controllers made by 8BitDo and they feel really good. And best of all, they're wireless. They use a direct 2.4 gigahertz connection, so no extra Bluetooth nonsense lagging it up. I went ahead and tested it alongside an original SNES controller, and yeah, the RefNet adapter adds basically no lag at all, while the wireless controller adds only about half a frame. The hardest core of the speedrunners out there might not like this, but for most people, this is pretty good news. The added latency is imperceivable for the vast majority of people. This Raffinet adapter also opens a world of opportunity. But what if you want a more authentic controller experience? Well, just use your Game Boy, you dolt. Introducing the Nintendo GameCube Game Boy Advance Link Cable. All you have to do is plug it into your GBA, turn it on, and you're good to go. The GBA SP's clicky D-pad is actually one of my favorites to use, so this is a great option to have. Unfortunately, the oversized connector just kills the ergonomics. Like, what am I supposed to do with my index fingers? This just ruins it. Many consider the SP to be cramped already, forcing me to push the shoulder buttons with the tips of my index fingers? Yeah, no thanks. The ergonomics are probably better for the original Game Boy Advance, but with the less clicky D-pad there, you might as well just use the SNES controller. Again, I tested the input lag, and it doesn't appear to add any. Now, I expect all of these measurements to have error margins of at least a tenth of a frame, so I'd consider the GBA Link Cable, the SNES controller, the GameCube controller, and the original DS to all be essentially tied for input lag. So, for the hardest core speedrunners, there doesn't really seem to be any option for recording while simultaneously having the lowest possible input lag. Um, the best you can do is about a frame above the original handheld. That's good enough for most people though, and it allows for tons of flexibility. So, if you're one of the three people watching this who'd like to see me investigate GBA input lag a little further, then sound off in the comments. Otherwise, I'll see you two years from now when I decide to make something else. Later!